Did you enjoy the enthusiasm of Rosa's sharing? That was a blessing. Thank you for the Culver story also. I identified with that. It took me several hours before I could knock on the first door of the summer that I decided to sell books house to house. And Patty, you have blessed me with a song that is my favorite. When you first began singing, I said, some of that sounds like M100. But then she went into her own improvisation, but she came back to the chorus. Did you receive a blessing from that? Amen. Thank you. Amen. That was a real blessing. Amen. It is a privilege and an anticipated blessing to study God's Word with you this morning. A week ago last night, before we began our Friday evening study, I was asked if I would speak this morning. So before we began our study, I asked everyone present, do you think it would be appropriate for me to speak at an 11 o'clock service on what we have been studying for four weeks? And the consensus was unanimous. Yes. So this morning I want to share with you an introduction to what we have been studying for four weeks on Friday evening at our home. There are a few books in the Bible that specifically guarantee us a blessing if we study that book. Revelation is one of those books. Revelation 1 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and cherish, guard, protect, appreciate. That's what the word keep means. Those things which I have written. Because what? The time is at hand. That's Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. In chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, however, Jesus inspires John the Revelator to do something very, very important. In chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, Jesus inspires John to record the history of the world from the time that Jesus was resurrected until the time that Jesus returns. We're studying right now in the Adult Sabbath School Lesson Study Guide, the Book of Acts. The very first church that Jesus addresses is the Ephesus church. And the historical period of time of Ephesus is A.D. 30 to 100 A.D. Jesus says something very interesting to each of these seven churches. The first thing that he does is he identifies himself with a unique name for each church. The name that Jesus uses or the title that Jesus uses for, for himself, for his message to each of these churches, deals with the issues that Jesus knows they will be facing in the future. And the title that he uses for himself is, I am the solution for the issues that you will be dealing with in the future. Then he goes into some detail in explaining the challenges that they are going to have. And to each church he begins, the second thing he says is, I know your situation, or I know your deeds, or I know your works. I know what you're facing in the future. And again, I'm the solution. I'm not only the solution, but I guarantee that you will, here's the next word, overcome. Amen. To every one of the churches, he says the same thing. What Jesus is doing, by introducing himself with a different title, and describing to them in great detail what they have to look forward in the future, and that he is the solution, And that he knows that if they follow the solution, they are guaranteed to overcome. What we've been studying for four weeks on Friday evenings is the history of the seventh church in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 
through 21. It's called the Laodicean Church. Some Seventh-day Adventists believe that the Laodicean Church applies to them. That is not exactly biblically correct. The Laodicean message applies to everyone that claims to be a Christian. In each of these churches, Jesus is not only identifying himself, but he's making a spiritual evaluation of the spiritual condition of the individuals in these churches. And he does this by their works. He tells them right up in front, I know your situation, I know your deeds, or I know your works. Because our works is what tells, what tells Jesus what our spiritual condition is. For example, when Jesus was teaching his disciples, he says something to them very, very interesting. I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Some people associate the book of Matthew, especially chapter 5, with the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus is saying something very, very important to his disciples. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read two verses for you. Are you there? Okay. Beginning with verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify who? Your Father, which is in heaven. We teach our children at a very early age, even in the cradle world, a little song that is very cute. Let this light of mine, what? Shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Beautiful. I want to get into a little grammar here, though, in verses 14 and 16 of Matthew 5. The word that Jesus is using for light, L-I-G-H-T, is in the singular form. And the word your is in the plural form. We need to understand that we are not the light. Amen. We are the system, the delivery system, by which that light is diffused to whomever Jesus brings into our life to witness. Hallelujah. That is in the plural. Your is in the plural. And at whatever age... We hear someone talk about, let this light of mine, let it shine. We make to, need to make a clear distinction that Jesus is the light. Yes. We are the lamp. So, even though no one is saved by works, Galatians 2.16, no one is going to be in heaven without good works. Why? Because justification by faith guarantees... That if you are abiding in Christ, Christ will use you to shine His light through to whomever it is that He brings into our lives. The book of Revelation is a very symbolic book. It's actually half a book. The first half of the book is the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel we have symbols also, like a statue made of many different metals, gold, silver, bronze, etc. It also talks in Daniel about another symbol, wild animals. The book of Revelation deals with a symbol of sevens, seven trumpets, seven seals, seven last plagues, seven churches. This morning we're going to focus on the seventh church. So when Jesus says to us in Revelation 3.15, you are not hot, you are not cold, you are lukewarm. We must not go to a secular dictionary to find out what the definitions of hot, cold, and lukewarm are. We have done that unfortunately in our church for almost 174 years. Lukewarm is not talking about complacency.
To whom is the message of the seven churches addressed to? Let's take a look. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 20. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The word angels here is again symbolic. It's speaking of the spiritual leaders of the church. It could be deacons, it could be elders, it could be Sabbath school teachers. But the, my, the main thrust, the main direction of it is to the pastors, the ministers of the church. The Living Bible, the Living Bible, which is a paraphrase, uses the word, instead of angels, it uses the word leader. The pulpit commentary uses the term the chief officers. Who is addressing the message to the seven churches? Let me read it to you. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. The word Amen is a proper noun. And it's speaking of when we submit a prayer to God, how do we end? May it be your will that my request is acceptable and that you will answer it. And then I say what? Amen. Amen. Yes. The word itself means so be it. So Jesus is what? He is the amen. He is the truth speaking. The faithful and true witness. He is the beginning of what? All the creation. The word beginning has caused some problems in the Christian church. Including the Seventh-day Adventist church. Many of our pioneers, including the husband of one of the founders of our church, believed that Jesus had a beginning. That he was a created being. Let's turn to John chapter 1 to find out what the Bible tells us regarding Jesus, the one that is speaking to the seven churches and uses this expression, I am the beginning. John chapter 1, first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is it speaking of? Jesus. Christ. Verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. Was. 3. All things came into being by Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So if Jesus is a created being, that means that He created Himself. Does that make any sense? As I mentioned before, in each of his, the messages to the seven churches, Jesus gives himself a title. And that title relates to the issues that they are dealing with or will be dealing with in their individual lives and in the future. What is Jesus saying to Laodicea when he says, I and the only true witness. I am the source of your creation. The word beginning is not talking about something starting. It has to do with origin. I am the source of everything that you need for the solutions to your circumstances. <coughs> so a clear understanding of Revelation 3, 15 and 16 is the key to a meaningful study of the Laodicean message. The key statement is in verse 15. I 
know your works. What is Jesus trying to say to the Laodicean church by that statement? I know your works. Is Jesus talking about our denominational works, our hospitals, our education system, our retirement homes, our nursing homes? The issue in the Laodicean message is not a lack of works. Frequently, I hear sermons, not here, or read articles, where I'm admonished that I must, or should do this, ought to do this, or must do this. But Jesus is saying to me, Chuck, I know your works. I have no problem with the quantity of your works. In the New Testament, the spiritual temperature reading of my works is measured or identified by works of the flesh, works of faith, and works of the law. Cold works represents what my natural sinful nature will produce. And that's recorded, and I invite you to turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read what Paul is inspired to record regarding my works of the flesh. Cold works. Galatians 5, beginning with verse 19. Now the deeds or the works of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible describes the works of the flesh as sin or missing the mark. But why does Paul identify the works of the flesh as cold? The reason he does is because the main person of the New Testament calls it that. I'm going to read it to you from Matthew 24, verse 12. Matthew 24, verse 3. Jesus' disciples say to him, Okay, you convince us that your kingdom is not of this world, so please tell us when you're coming back. And Jesus just does, does just that. And in verse 12, he says something very interesting to them. Matthew 24. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow what? Cold. Cold. So the Bible clearly identifies that the natural works of the flesh... Biblically speaking, are cold works. What is opposite to cold? Hot. Now, let's take a look at verses 22 and 23, two passages that many of you are very familiar with. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit or the works of the Spirit are what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The Holy Spirit and the law of God are in complete agreement that each of you would experience these nine blessings of justification by faith. If cold works are the works of the flesh and hot works are the works of faith, then what? Or works of the law. Turn with me to Romans chapter 9, where Paul makes a dramatic contrast between works, hot works of faith, and works of the law. Romans chapter 9. When you get there, stay ready. We're going to read three verses. Romans chapter 9. 
beginning with verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attain righteousness, even the righteousness which is of what? Faith. By faith. The heathen achieved righteousness. 31. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Verse 32. Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as through it were, as it were, by what? Works of the law. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. What does the Apostle Paul mean by works of the law? In the Greek language or in the Hebrew language, there is no expression or word like we have in English for legalism. So whenever the New Testament writers are speaking of works of legalism, they identify it as works of the law. Let's check that out. Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to begin with verse 7, but the punchline is in verse 9, we're going to read 7 and 8 for the sake of context, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ, verse 8, more than that. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count everything that I have lost as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. That's a very politically correct word that he uses there, the translators use. Rubbish. The word is actually compost. Verse 9. And may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of what? Faith. We have a term in the English language that describes my own righteousness that we just read in Philippians 7, 9. That word is self-righteousness or works of the law. Self-righteousness is a combination of cold and hot. In self-righteousness, who is doing the works? The spirit or my self-righteousness? But the works of the flesh are out and out evil. But self-righteousness works are not evil. Visually, they appear very good. Do self-righteous works go to church on Saturday? Yes. Do works of faith go to church on Saturday? Yes. The question then is what is the motivation for going to church on Saturday? surface are righteous in appearance, but they are deceiving because the motivation is self-righteousness. One of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church wrote about self-righteousness. It's recorded in Volume 7 of the Bible Commentary Series, page 963. I'll read it to you. Your set quote, your self-righteousness is nauseating to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the writer quotes Revelation 3, 15 and 18. Then she continues. These words apply to the churches and to many of those in positions of trust in the work of God. Self-righteousness is not the wedding garment. A failure to follow the clear light of truth is our fearful danger. The message to the Laodicean church reveals our condition as a people. End quote. So
So according to Jesus, what is our condition? Lukewarm. Making him feel like vomiting us out of his mouth. Revelation 10, verse 4. In steps to Christ, 